cool. All right, well, we are going to uh, talk this morning. Um, we're, in the, we're in the middle of, of series, so we ended a series, and we haven't started a new series yet, and so we've got a couple weeks here of standalone kind of messages, and I actually like that sometimes because I'm able to just ask God, what should we talk about as a church? And so I've been reading a lot and listening to a lot of podcasts, I don't know about you, but I love to listen to other preachers. Maybe that's just because I'm a preacher, I don't know. Um, but I listen to pastors all day long in my car and uh, on YouTube and that kind of thing. And I started looking up this concept about a chapter in the Bible that I was reading. And it was one of those where I was like, what is kind of going on here? You ever read a chapter in the Bible and you're kind of like, what's going on? A lot. Megan talked about that in our leadership service this morning. Like, you read something and you're just like, what's the point of this? So you kind of just disregard it. Well, it's one of those passages this morning. So if you've got your Bible, we're going to go over to Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16, and we're just going to read the last few verses, and then I'll kind of explain what's going on here, and hopefully we'll get some really good insights from God today of what he wants to teach us out of Numbers chapter 16. We're going to start reading in verse 41. It says, The next day the whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. You have killed the Lord's people, they said. But when the assembly gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron and turned towards the tent of meeting, suddenly a cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron went to the front of the tent of the meeting and the Lord said to Moses, get away from this assembly so I can put an end to them at once. And they fell face down. Then Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put incense in it along with burning coals from the altar and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord and the plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said and ran in the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead and the plague stopped. But 14,700 people died from the plague, in addition to those who had died because of Korah. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting, for the plague had stopped. Let's pray this morning, and then we'll dive into what is going on in this passage. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Old Testament and some of these stories that we get into, and we try to figure out what's going on, and I thank you for your Holy Spirit revealing to us what you're calling us to. I pray this morning that you give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying, and that we would be open and attentive to your word, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to us this morning on the topic of one person can make a difference. One person can make a difference. Have you ever seen one person in your life that you can look at in history and identify, or maybe someone you know personally that made a difference in a huge way as one person? One of my heroes probably in life more than any other one, and I've probably read more and watched more on this person is William Wilberforce. If you know anything about William Wilberforce, he lived in the 18th century, and he was the one who started the trek of abolishing slavery in Europe. And when William was growing up and was trying to figure out what he wanted to do with his life, he was at a place where he really felt like he came from a family of politicians, and that was what he was supposed to do, was be a politician. But he felt this call also, and he wanted to serve God with his life. And so he's in this place where he's grappling, should I, should I go be into ministry, or should I go be a politician, and I don't know. And at one point in his life, all these people come around him, and they basically say, William, you can do both. You can serve God and fight against injustice. And William takes their advice, and how many know that sometimes it's really good to heed instruction, to take advice from people, right? Sometimes we get people want to tell us their, their opinion. I'm not talking about opinion, okay? I'm talking about when you go to someone for wisdom and they give you wisdom, sometimes it feels like opinion and you're like, I don't want to do what you said. But if they're wiser than you, older than you, I would say listen to what they have to say because they've been around the mountain, so to speak, a few more times. And these people come to William who's young and they say, William, you can do both. Go and fight this injustice of slavery of all these slaves who are being drugged from Africa to Europe and fight this because one person can make a difference. And so William Wilberforce begins to abolish slavery and he takes his entire life fighting against the, the, um, the policies and the, the, the legal things that were set up to say it was okay and all these things. And there was times in his life where he was ready to quit. There was times when, when literally he got so ill that he couldn't even get out of bed because he had fought so hard. 
But I'll never forget the quote in the movie Amazing Grace at the end of the movie. William Wilberforce stands there and they announce that the slave trade is no more. And the, the voiceover in it said, uh, one of the guys in the movie says, not tonight William Wilberforce will lay his head on his pillow knowing that the slave trade is no more. And he only lived a few years after that. But one person leading the way abolished slavery and changed the trajectory of history a couple hundred years ago because he chose to do what God called him to do. One person can make a difference. In Numbers chapter 16, where we read this morning, we come into an interesting story starting in verse 41. We've come into a place where a man by the name of Korah has been really um, complaining and rebelling against Israel. This is the time where the Israelites have been in the wilderness and, and they're on the journey to the promised land. And, and, and for lack of a better term, they kind of just got burnt out in continuing to follow. They, 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 Moses had been leading and they're just like, Moses, we're getting done and why are you the one in charge? And so they start rebelling against Moses and rebelling against God. And it's interesting that they didn't just rebel against God or just Moses, but they start rebelling against both and they start complaining and they start saying, we're not doing this and, and we're not gonna do, how are you up here and you're telling us all these things you're gonna do and then you, and they don't happen and, and, and they start fighting, it was the Reubenites and the Levites and they start fighting against each other and it's just all this, this scene of chaos at the beginning of number 16 where Moses, as the leader, is looking at the people going, I don't know what to do. And so he goes before God and he says, God, I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? And in this passage, God is angry. And God is going, look, I'm done with these rebels. I'm just going to smite them. That's not a good day when God is angry. See, we like to think about God in his love. And I don't want you to get the picture this morning that God is anything but love because God is love. Love, God, God exudes love. But do you know sometimes when you love somebody, you can get angry with them? Why typically do you get angry with them? Because they're doing something to disrespect or rebel or hurt you. And you know how much you love and how much you want to pour out for them. And they are not receiving it. And you're just like, I'm done. So I think sometimes we judge God, right? We're like, how, how are you in the Old Testament? And God's like, my love was so deep for them, but they didn't want to receive it. And I was just saying, look. Now, the beauty of living on this side of the Christ is Jesus never says, I'll smite you. He says, I'll take all of it. That's why God sent his son Jesus into the world. He said not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so Jesus comes into the world and says, I'll love you no matter what. But in the Old Testament, in, in, in number 16, it doesn't mean that God didn't have a love for them. It meant that the situation in this, in this place where they were, where they were rebelling against God, and God thought, I, I, I don't need to look at this anymore. And so the people begin to die. In fact, earlier in number 16, the earth opens up and the people fall into the earth and die. Almost 14, over 14,700 of them actually die. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? 14,000 people are dead. And so Moses and Aaron are watching this and they're seeing what's going on and they're kind of ticked off too. They're kind of sick of the rebellion. They've been leading these people for years and years and years, and the, the people have gotten mad no matter what's happened in the wilderness. They keep, they keep getting mad at Moses, and Moses is trying to lead well and trying to do this, and, and, and Moses is in that place. So now you've got God angry at the people and Moses angry with the people, and Moses is like, take them out, God. Anybody ever felt that way? Take my enemies out. Just, just annihilate them because I don't want to deal with them anymore. And so they get taken out. And then Moses starts to have a change in his heart and realizes, I don't want to lose all these people. And so what we read this morning in Numbers chapter 41, Moses begins to identify there's an issue going on here. But a heart of compassion comes up in him for these people. And he says to Aaron, Aaron, Get to the altar, take your incense, let's go before God. And that last verse we read said, and let's stand between the dead and the living. 
And so Aaron goes and he stands between those who are dead and those who are living and basically gets down on his knees and he's got his incense and he's like, God, please don't take him out. I want to be the person who says I will intervene for them. I will repent for them. I know they've been rebellious. I know this. But if you would just allow me the grace of being the one who can stand between the dead and the living so more lives are not lost. And God had favor on him. And it says the plague was stopped. Can one person make a difference? Absolutely. I wonder in our lives today, how many of us look at the world around us and think the issues of our day are so great, why even fight it? Why even? You can't beat them, join them, right? There's no, there's no reason to pray for the world. There's no reason to go tell the gospel to the world because it's, who, it's not going to matter, right? The world's so big, I'm just one person. But can one person make a difference? I believe this story shows us that yes, It can. And so if we want to be people who say we will make a difference, how do we do that in the way that Aaron did it in his life? You're taking notes this morning. Here's some things that you can write down about how that how you can be a person who makes a difference. The first thing is to recognize the plague of our time. You see here that Moses and Aaron realized that not only had the people been rebellious, but their rebellion led to a plague. Well, you know about plagues in the Old Testament. Locusts came and the water turned to blood. And there's all these different plagues that happened in the Old Testament where they recognized that these are, this is something that was sent to take people out. And if someone doesn't intervene, if God doesn't change, his, if God doesn't just step in and intervene and let the plague go away, stop the plague, then this generation is going to die. And so the first thing we have to ask ourselves if we want to be a person who says, can one person make a difference and one person change the world, we have to recognize the plague of our time. How many of you would say that you see things around your life or around the world that you'd say that's kind of a plague trying to take people out? You don't have to look very far. You don't have to turn on the news very long this week. I was watching all the stuff going on with just the injustice things towards racial stuff and all these things. And honestly, one night I was, I was sitting there watching this news thing and I felt myself getting angry. And I told Kelsey, I got to like qu- stop watching this because I want to run through the TV and just shake some people. Ever feel that way? Because it's just so unjust. And I can't believe that, that, that things would be the way they are in the world we live in. But then what we do is we kind of step back and go, well, I guess, what am I going to do, though? I'm just sitting here in my living room watching this on my phone, right? What, what am I going to do? What are the plagues in our lives. And here's what I want to challenge you with. If you want to make a difference in the world and you want to build the kingdom of God and you're trying to figure out how, what angers you? Because the very thing that makes you angry is probably the thing you're called to go and do. The very thing that, that, that stirs you up and gets you passionate and as my dad used to say, brought out my redheaded temper is probably the thing that I'm called to do if it is bringing justice to someone or building the kingdom of God by sharing the gospel with someone. When I look at the things around the world and what makes me angry and what makes me mad and what what stirs me up and the plagues that I see is I cannot stand churches where people aren't welcomed and loved with open arms. So that's why I'm the pastor here. When this opportunity came up, it was like, yes, I want to be part of a place that says we are for the city. We're not just here for our four and no more. We are, the church is built to be a beacon of hope to the world, not to stay to ourselves and sit on our pews and be like, oh, we're good, we're good. No, we're called to be filled up to go out. And, I, and, it, and, and it just makes me like, oh, when I, when, I, when I talk to pastors who are like, I just, I don't really know how we can reach the community because we just don't, we don't really have a, one guy said, we don't really have a heart for the community. I'm like, well, then why are you in the community if you don't have a heart for the community? Like, Anyway, so that's something that infuriates me. I've told you guys before, another thing that infuriates me is kids who don't have access to education. Because the way I was raised, I never worried if I was going to learn how to read or write or do arithmetic. 
That's an old word. I never worried if I was going to study. And I never worried if, if, if my parents were going to could allow me to learn and to read. And if I was struggling, put me in a tutor and all these different things. And all over this city and cities all over are kids who do not have access to education. Or we have teachers that are giving their all and giving their all and giving their all. And they can't get to every kid because they have classroom sizes that are enormous because of budget cuts. And these kids are falling through the cracks and then getting passed on because we have to because it's all about the money. Now I'm getting on my soapbox. And so it makes me mad that we have these kids that don't get access to what I had access to. And that's why I run the Center for Success Network. Not because it's glorious and glamorous and trust me, my social media makes my life look a lot better than it is, okay? But because I am fueled by the fact that there are people who don't get access to learning who they are and ultimately learning that they're a child of God because they can't even read. And that's the plague that fuels me. What do you see across the world that just drives you crazy and makes you think, I don't know if anyone can make a difference. Can I challenge you this morning? You can be that difference. So you recognize the plague of our time. The second thing you can write down is that you have a heart of compassion for the brokenness around you. Have a heart of compassion for the brokenness around you. You notice that when Moses and Aaron, in the beginning of chapter, chapter 16 of Numbers, when they first see the rebellion of the people, they're mad with them, right? They're just like, this is stupid. I see why God's mad. This is, you guys are just crazy. I don't know why I'm out here leading you anyways. I, I, Moses left the palace for crying out loud, right? Like, I don't know what I did this for. Like, this is crazy, and then he begins to get this heart of compassion for the people he's leading. And his heart begins to break to the point where he says, Aaron, we've got to step in because if we don't intervene, these people are going to die. Compassion moves us to do. Sometimes we want to think we have compassion. And just saying, oh, that's too bad, is not compassion. Compassion is a verb. It's an action word. It moves you to go and do something. Tim Andrews sitting up here talking about this building. The reason this building is being restored is because Tim came to me and he said, I can't not do this, so let's do this. And I'm like, cool. If we got one, we got all. Let's go. Because I have no clue how to restore buildings. Trust me. My father-in-law and my mother-in-law are here today. Say hi back there. Those are Kelsey's parents. He was helping me work in our yard last night, and it's always fun to watch me learn how to work, I have to say. Because <laughs> it's, if we had cameras, we could probably make money. <laughs> but, but, but you don't want me restoring the building. But when Tim came and said, I've got a passion for this, and I can't not do it because this is the building where I found God, then the one person said, we can make a difference. And his compassion moved him to action. William Wilberforce's compassion saying slavery is wrong, it can, it's got to be ended. He could have sat in his big house and gone, man, it's too bad those people are treated unfairly. But no, he got off and literally fought to his death because of his heart of compassion. And so the second thing you have to do is say, God, give me compassion for the injustice that I see. Sometimes I have to have compassion when I'm working with Center for Success and going into meetings and talking to people who, who don't necessarily understand why we're doing what we're doing. And I have to have compassion for those people to, to say, you know what, they don't understand and so I gotta do something regardless of what they think and I, gotta, I, got, and I don't do it out of spite and I can't do it out of anger, but I have to do it out of a heart that says, I love these people so much that I have to do it. Compassion moves you. To action. The third thing you can write down as we start wrapping this up this morning is that you run to the altar. When Moses started having a heart of compassion for the plague, and he's like, the plague has got to stop. We've got to spare these people. Immediately, Aaron ran to the altar and got before God and said, God, I will stand between the dead and the living. I think sometimes in the church, we get so passionate about what we're going to do that we forget we cannot do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Good is not God. God is good. 
And so we can do all the good we want to do, but if God doesn't empower us to go and do it and the the gospel isn't at the root of everything we're doing, then what's the point? Because this life is short. The world is broken all around us. They need the hope of Christ. And if we're just doing things for the sake of doing them, what's the point? But if we stay, we're restoring a building We're educating kids. We're making a difference in our community because ultimately we want them to connect with the God of the universe so they spend eternity in heaven. Then we have to realize we've got to get before God in prayer. There's been a theme in our church over the last year, I would say even more the last six months, of this just this like just needing God's presence and needing prayer. There's been weeks where this altar has been packed with you guys saying, God, I need you. Can I encourage you that this altar is a place when you come here on Sundays where you can go before God and lay out your heart of compassion and lay out the plagues that you see and say, God, empower me for it. But can I also encourage you that you can build an altar in your own house? You don't have to wait for Sunday morning. You can get up on Monday morning and kneel down next to your bed because where two or or, or, sorry, where Jesus Christ is alive in you, and so when you're with Him, the Bible says, "Where two or three are gathered in My name, there am I." You and God are a majority. Anybody know that? Just just in case you didn't know, you and God are a majority, and you sit there and, and you're with God, and you say, "God, I can't do today without you. I can't fight what you've called me to fight." I can't even identify the injustice that I, some of you come into a place with God where you're like, God, I don't even see brokenness around me because I'm so focused on my brokenness. I learned a term a few weeks ago that I think is hilarious. It's called navel, navel, hold on, navel gazer, navel gazer. Have you ever heard this term? Never heard it before. Jana has now because we call our staff uh, Marco Polo app thing, navel gazers because it's funny. But so I'll let you all in on the inside joke. Navel gazers is when you find out a lot about yourself, okay? And you're like, whoo, look at me, and I'm, I'm so great. And, I, and if you're like me, you like strength finders, you're like, I'm woo, and I'm communication, and I'm activator, and I'll look at me, and you're just gazing at yourself, and you forget that there's a whole world out beyond you. And I think sometimes why the world looks the way it looks and why there's so much brokenness around us is because as a church, we're like, wow. Man, God really moved in me. Like Jesus saved my life. And did I tell you that I got healed? And did I tell you my marriage has been restored? And did I tell you that, that God's doing things in my church? And like, did, did, oh, this is, this is really good. And we stay like this. But we were never intended to run to the altar to be like this. Because the last thing you can write down is that once you're at the altar is you get up and you get going. You can't just sit at the altar and say, God, fill me up, 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 fill me up. Because the problem is if you've been in the church a long time, you're so full, you're ready to pop. And if you don't go let some of that fullness out, it's not going to do anything but make you fat. Just sit right in this presence. Oh, I just need more of you, more of you, more of you. You know who the people are that change the world? Are the people who say, I need more of you, I need more of you, I need more of you. And then they go out and they give them out and they give them out and they give them out. And then they run back in and they say, I need more, I need more, I need more. And then they give it away and they give it away and they give it away. I was listening to a pastor this week who said that, that, that she spends sometimes four or five hours a day with God. And someone said, well, <laughs> how do you get anything done? And their ministry literally has offices on 60, in 63 nations of the world. She said, I don't get it done because I take a break from the presence of God. I get it done because I go with the presence of God. Because see, when you're in that place of altar, when you get up, that alters you. And the presence of God goes with you. But you have to get up and get going to be the person who can make a difference. So as we close this morning, my question for us is simple. Can one person make a difference? And if you believe that one person can make a difference, would you be that one? I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes around this room. I know that all of us carry in here with us each time we walk in the weight of the week, the struggles that we've faced, the arguments that maybe you've had or some of you, it's even deeper rooted and you've faced abuse this week and you've faced things that have hurt you deeply to your core and you come in here and you're like, I'm so broken, I don't even know if I could make a difference. 
Hear my heart when I say this to those of you that are severely wounded this morning. Could it be that the very thing you're called to make a difference in is the thing that's hurting you right now? Could it be that you face so much abuse in your life and you're so hurting by that person that hurts you and what God is calling you is to be someone that goes out and fights against abuse in our world? Could it be that the very thing that is trying to keep you back is the thing that God is calling you to go make a difference for to build his kingdom? Some of you would say this morning that you don't know if you can make a difference because you don't know if the gospel has really made a difference in you. Can I challenge you this morning that if you've given your life to Christ, you've already been changed? So what you need to do now is go and call others to his kingdom and tell them about Christ and tell them what he's done for your life. Instead of sitting around trying to figure out how you fix everything, just go and let God fix you as you go. And so this morning, I'm not gonna do an altar call and I'm not gonna even have you raise your hands this morning yet. But I do want to give you some space to ask God, can you make a difference? And to get the idea down deep in you that you can. And so for the next minute or two, I just want to give us some space as Caleb plays. You know as you're sitting here what plague you see. You know what your heart of compassion is moving towards. So for the next two minutes, let's just create an altar in each of us and say, God, what do I need to do? And let's listen to his Holy Spirit. So God, this morning we ask that your Holy Spirit would lead us to a place where we can be difference makers in our world. I pray, God, that the things that we're mad at right now, you'd give us a heart of compassion for. I pray the things that we have compassion for, that you'd move us to a place of seeking you and spending time in your presence and spending time in your word and asking you to fill us up so we can stand in the gap for those that we're fighting for. And then give us the strength to get up and get going, God. Lord, this life is short for so many of us, God, especially those of us in here that are younger. We feel like this world's gonna last forever, but it's not gonna last forever. And God, I don't wanna get to the end of my life and look back and think, well, I did a couple things. But God, I, I pray that you would give us the courage and the passion to do everything you put in our hearts to do, to do it with compassion and to do it with the gospel at the center so that we can reach a world who's so far from you in so many ways. But Lord, I thank you that that heart of compassion that you give us helps us to see that world not through eyes of judgment, but through eyes of grace and eyes of love. So help us to go and to fight and to do what you've called us to do, to build your kingdom, but don't let us do it in a way that makes us bitter. Let us do it in a way that gives us such a love and such a compassion for those around us and call us into action to build your kingdom. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me this morning? I always think it's funny that when I get real quiet and I'm always like, okay, God, what do you want to say to me? Sometimes he speaks to me in animated movies. And I just heard 
Dory from Finding Nemo. <laughs> just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. So I don't know if that encourages anybody, but... <laughs> You may already know, you may already be doing what God's called you to do, but you just maybe don't want to do it. Just keep swimming. All right. Hey, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. So glad you guys are here. Thank you for uh, just continuing to support each other in this ministry. If you need prayer for anything and you want more support in your life, um, our prayer workers will be down here. They'd love to pray with you uh, after the service. If your first time here, we'd love to connect with you back at our Connect desk and get you more information. Um, and also, if you want to uh, pledge to the building campaign, those are back there as well. I'm praying for you guys this week that you will be bold to step out and do what God has called you to do and believing that you can make a difference. Before we go, let's confess the blessing over ourselves and our week that my best and most blessed days are ahead of me. Love you guys. Hope